Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to be reading True Scary Cult Stories. I hope you enjoy them. So, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. Exchange students sometimes have the worst. I was an exchange student from Malaysia and was placed in Missouri in 2006. They were a family of four, a son and a daughter, and they lived somewhere around Webster Groves. They looked nice, warm and welcoming, but it was all a facade for they were trying to gain my trust. Coming from a country where all your neighbors are practicing a million different religions would kind of desensitize you or make you very aware. I was the latter. The first week was fine, but sometimes I would wake up a little bit early and find them gathered in the kitchen in a circle, around the kitchen table, mumbling and whispering. They'd stop as soon as I entered. It was very disconcerting, but I brushed it off thinking that it was just an American quirk. During the second and third week it became worse. The boy wouldn't touch me because I'm born from sin, his words not mine, and the girl was afraid of me because I spoke to the father whilst looking him in the eye. I started prodding her for answers whenever little things that I did, which are normal by the way, like reading before bed, talking directly to the parents and eating a sandwich, would elicit small gasps and hyperventilation. She told me that I have residues of the wicked and that I'm going to hell. She told me about a cleanse and a daily prayer wash. I've seen them singing the same hymns over and over again, reciting the same verses in different tones, and it really freaked me out. I wasn't stupid. I realized I was in a cult when they took me to church. I was made to sit in the front, and the pastor was conducting the service specifically for me. I realized it when I looked around and saw that everyone was looking at me. I felt like I was in a horror movie. Wide-eyed, silent stares. Men and women were separated. People wore different colored ribbons on their wrists, and the children looked haunted or just plain frightened. Nobody spoke to me or even came close to me. The men never looked me in the eye, and the women whispered and shunned me. I went there twice. School was on break, so I had to stay in with them. Many weird things happened, but none was as bad as waking up in the middle of the night to find the mother sitting next to my bed, reciting verses from the Bible in the dark. As soon as I'm awake, she'd stop and silently walk away. The family began treating me very badly after that. I was punished for being out of line. No dinner, locked in until morning, no sweet drinks. I had to cover up with long sleeve tops, long pants, a skirt, etc., I think I lasted because I was curious. They probably thought that since I was from Southeast Asia, I must be quite gullible and naive. They tried brainwashing me about how sinful I was, how lost I was, how the world is going to end and I'll be dragged to hell unless I accept their teachings. I was there for a month before our chapter coordinator came by for a visit. I told her everything, outside of the house naturally, and I left with her immediately. We came back with a group of people from the exchange organization about an hour later and found them in the midst of burning the things of the sinful non-believer. Thankfully, my passport and other relevant documentation was untouched. I never found out what kind of cult they were. I was raised in cult teachings in an isolated homeschool environment, and then my family moved to the cult later. Brainwashing was there. It wasn't obviously wrote in the same thing every time, 
as the pastor was very charismatic and convincing, but it actually was. We sang about only 20 songs, mostly hymns over the course of the time that I was there. It was run and controlled by a single pastor. There was a board, but there was no accountability. It was kind of a joke. Only the most supportive, i.e. the people who considered him always right, were elected to the board. It was very abusive and controlling. Coffee was unspiritual. Missing meetings gained you a phone call from a board member telling you that you were breaking fellowship. Everything was about the pastor. I mean, literally. Sin was thinking negative thoughts about the group and the pastor. He set himself up as the wisest man on earth. For the girls they had it worse. He would convince each one that they had a problem, i.e. idolatry, and he would proceed to abuse them. The cult was less than 30 people. As for why he's not in jail, settlements. My experience was awful. I had some serious depersonalization, and the effects on me are awful. Living in fear, anxiety, Intense emotional pain. Constant flashbacks. It's really bad. My parents are still in it, and relationships with them are probably impossible. Talking about anything will get me verbal abuse. Child abuse is really bad. I left this last year, so I'm still processing a lot. I want to try to be concise and still give a proper breakdown of my time growing up in a cult. I'm going to start by breaking down the ideology. The second coming of Christ. They believe the second coming is and was alive. He was a Korean man who went by the name of Reverend Sun Myung Moon. He was given the mission by Jesus in a vision when he was 16 years old on a mountaintop. And it is his purpose to create an example of the ideal family so all may shape their families in its likeness and create an ideal world. Restoration of the Fall Jesus forgives your sins, but what about restoring humanity to what it was before, the Fall, by paying spiritual indemnities and cleansing humanity of those sins in the first place? Their idea of indemnity is almost like paying karma forward. You can put yourself through misery to either pay for past mistakes of humanity or to ensure that good things will happen in the future. You can pay indemnity by, one, living in a van for years and years on one of their task forces, fundraising by selling candles or wind chimes, sometimes more than 14 hours a day. Two, getting an arranged marriage after abstaining from absolutely any contact with the opposite sex all of your life by the Reverend himself, or now your parents thereby overcoming the temptation of the fall by denying your desires and obeying the church completely. Actually, this is the most important aspect of the church, that you get matched and blessed their word for marriage. It is the only thing that will eventually restore humanity. 3. Converting other members. 4. Doing hundreds or thousands of bows to a picture of Reverend Moon every night for about X amount of days. 5 taking cold showers every day for X days. Six, fasting. You can drink water for a provincial number of days, either three, seven, 21, or 40. Note, you must do a seven day fast before you get to get married. Seven, giving money offerings to the church. The church also started charging for ancestor liberation in the last couple of decades, just like old school Catholics. You can pay to have your dear old granddad hoisted out of the pits of hell. Since the church is Korean, they have deep resentment towards the Japanese, and ancestor liberation can be thousands of dollars per person liberated. For Americans, I think it was little over a hundred, I think. 8. Beat yourself to repetitive chants on an approved spirit cleansing event. 9. Or basically denying yourself of any human comfort or need for some time. Some do sleep deprivation conditions. There's a lot else, but I can't keep going. 
growing up in the church. There are countless strange rituals in the church. Like on your birthday, you and your whole family has to wake up at 5 a.m., go to the altar of Reverend Moon, say a prayer and offer food. When the ritual is almost over, the birthday kid usually has to take the food and offer some to each of the family members, and you always leave some on the altar. There are countless stories told to the second generation. Children born from marriages approved by Reverend Moon. We were supposed to have been born as purely as Jesus, without original sin. Of members who left the church and immediately got hit by a bus. Or became prostitutes and died from ODing. Or unalive themselves out of guilt. Koreans. Korea in the church is seen as the New Jerusalem. Koreans being the new chosen people. Every leader in the church is a Korean, despite the religion's heavy unification of world cultures and religions overtones. Koreans often were the only match to other Koreans. None of Moon's kids were allowed to marry anyone other than a Korean. Japanese members have always been in the church's cash cow, guilting them into paying more in tithing and overcharging them for everything. Americans got their fair share of that too. The church often comes up with a new ceremony like a holy wine ceremony, where drinking this new blessed wine, usually juice, will heal you of all of your sins. That, of course, you have to pay to get into. Sometimes they just make a big plea for extra money, like their total life offering, which was something like, if you paid the church $16,000, you would never have to pay them for anything again, which was a lie. Some members took out second mortgages on their houses to pay these offerings. My wrists are seriously hurting from typing this much, so I'll leave some space for questions. I haven't even made a dent in the beliefs, rituals, or culture of the church yet. Update. I will say, in response to people in this thread who ask how someone could fall for this, and how people could stay in for so long, cults like this never approach it like, hey, a Korean guy is the messiah. You want to join? They take you through steps, almost like Scientology, but not so clearly defined. The Unification Church was going around in America in the 70s, preaching a true love and family values, stuff many people, especially people with Christian backgrounds, can get behind. The church does have heavy Christian influence, so much of the language is the same, but they'll start discussing these things with you, like the evils of the world, if Jesus restored the world, then why would there need to be a second coming? We should prepare ourselves for the next Messiah. A Messiah is exactly what we need. How else can we right the wrongs of this world? Once you get them going on that, you just pump them up with all of the same religious feel-good stuff. God is our Father. God is watching out for you. He wants the best for you. God hurts when you don't do what's right. And eventually, God becomes some kind of emotionally sensitive dude that you have to coddle and take care of. Then, once your members are pumped, they're living in vans, they're trying to recruit other people. That's when you start with the deeper stuff. You know the Messiah is here. The tension has been building to this moment for literally years. The members are overjoyed and can't wait to do anything that this guy says so that they can be like Jesus' first disciples. No one thinks they're a victim. They think they're literally saving the world. It appealed to a lot of people who were raised Christian, but were dissatisfied with the contradictions or shortcomings of their parents' religions. Anyways, sorry for the block of text. I'm done. For now. I'm surprised that there aren't more former children of God slash the Family International babies posting on this thread. I was born and raised in the children of God slash the Family International, and I'm convinced that it is and was one of the most detrimental cults out there because of the way that their doctrines were weaved into every tiny area of people's lives. Everything was dictated by leadership and controlled by peer pressure. It was a communal cult. Hive mentality was rampant. The type of food you ate, the way you dressed, who you lived with, 
the education you received, the movies you watched, the music you listened to, who you married, everything was controlled. There was absolutely no real free will allowed, and very minimal contact with the outside world happened, except if you were asking people for money or trying to convert them to Christianity slash the cult. I left when I was in my early 20s, and it's only been a few years since then, so I'm still trying to unlearn a lot of things. I decided to go to college and get an education, and I'm so miserable because basic things like how to study for an exam or how to interact with your professor are completely foreign concepts to me. I didn't find out till college that I'm pretty good at science and math, subjects that were highly discouraged in the group, or if taught at all, were either very simplistic, math only went up to basic algebra if you were lucky, or taught with such a religious slash creationist spin that it's unrecognizable as science. Someone actually posted excerpts from the biology textbook that I had in high school here on Reddit a while ago, and everyone was commenting, huh, these are all lies and not real science. And I'm all, well, crap. I like to imagine that if I'd had regular schooling when I was younger, maybe I could have been an engineer or an astronaut or something awesome. People are probably going to counter with that statement with, it's never too late to try. Platitude. And I'd just say, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. Forget dating. I have more knowledge and experience under my belt than most people my age. And I don't have a clue what normal dating looks like. Passionate hugging is synonymous with intimacy. And that's synonymous with control. I am terrified of getting into a relationship because I know that it would be so ridiculously easy for someone to abuse their power over me. When you're raised to always say yes, you have no idea what a struggle it is to say no. When people find out about this cult, the thing that usually gets focused on the most is the sexual aspect of it. It was literally that kind of cult. But for me, the worst part is just having no frame of reference for connecting with other people outside the group. I can forget the bad things that happen and just get on with my life. But it's difficult knowing how to make new friends and build a life outside the FI. I just don't get most of what people talk about. I've only got a few years of movies, music, pop culture history in my brain, and I can't really relate to how other people react to things. I didn't have any of those normal experiences in high school like dating, going to prom, etc. My best friends are former TFI people because I can't seem to make real friends out here in the great wide jungle of the world. I wonder how I'll ever be able to get close to people when they will never be able to comprehend the experiences I've gone through. And at the same time, I can't relate to their experiences either. Real life things that most people take for granted, like graduating college, buying a house, having a successful job, etc., seem like fairy tales to me because nobody in my life growing up did those things. I don't have anybody who can give me advice on how to accomplish those normal life tasks because nobody I grew up with or our parents did any of those things. I feel pretty lost. I'm still picking pieces of this cult out of my identity and it's exhausting. Edit. I just wanted to add a random artifact for my upbringing. I went to see the Hunger Games catching fire recently and I broke down crying in the middle of it because I had a sudden realization that I grew up believing that the sort of apocalyptic, depressing scenario played out in the Hunger Games was an inevitable outcome in my future. Not the actual Hunger Games, obviously, but the extreme government control, oppression of the people, dire social circumstances, etc. It made me feel very alone in that moment, setting with the knowledge that I was viewing that very thing in my childhood nightmares and knowing that nobody around me could possibly comprehend the reasons for my tears. I was raised in a cult. Both of my parents were members of the Children of God, 
nowadays called the Family International. We traveled all over Europe from city to city and performed music on the streets and passed out leaflets to convert people. I have many brothers and sisters, mostly from different dads, as the philosophy of the sect was kind of rooted in the free love hippie movement. There are some pretty serious and I think conclusive accusations of child abuse within the sect, but thankfully my parents didn't do that. My stepdad, however, physically and verbally abused us, as corporal punishment was very encouraged. He never got caught, although we frequently showed overt signs of abuse, but since we weren't ever in one place for more than a couple of days, well, you get the picture. We were of course all homeschooled too, which I hated, since that was also a constant source of abuse. My stepdad taught me timetables by asking me repeatedly, what's X times Y? And if I'd get the result wrong, I'd get slapped on the fingers with a cooking spoon as many times as the result was. Thankfully, my parents got out of the sect by the time that I was about 13 years old. My stepdad didn't give up his habits though, which continued until I was old enough to fight back. Settling into regular school was very difficult, as I was constantly and heavily bullied for wearing secondhand clothes, not speaking German very well, and just being completely different. After a couple of years, though, I went from worst in the class to best, and being kind of accepted. Nowadays, I still have some lingering issues, which I'm not sure if they'll ever be fixable. One of them is trust issues, which has also prevented me so far from seeking therapy. It's all a very long time ago, too, and I've pretty much made my peace with all of it already. I think my parents got out of the sect before it got really crazy. I was born and raised in a cult, and considered myself a member up until I left my parents' home at the age of 18. The group that I was associated with is not well known, but the effects on the members are tragic and undeniable. We were literally brainwashed. We had weekly services with a set program, three hymns, prayer, sermonette, hymn, announcements, main message, hymn, and prayer. It never altered from that layout. As well, the messages that we would hear were often videotaped sermons from maybe five main people at headquarters. The topics were extremely narrow. Prophecy slash the end is coming. Self-improvement slash all of you suck and you should hate yourselves. Setting ourselves apart slash don't talk to worldly people, they will taint you. There were many ways in which we were indirectly encouraged to harm ourselves. Many people looked down upon modern medicine and felt that using it was a way of turning away from God, slapping him in the face, making it clear that he wasn't needed. I personally knew people who died for their faith, waiting for God to heal them. On the other hand, when any of the main leaders fell ill, they were immediately rushed off to receive medical care. They controlled our diet. We pretty much were kosher though they denied all influence or association from slash with the Jews. There were annual days of fasting, and whenever the leadership would scare up enough drama within the members, they would declare a church-wide fast so we could all get closer to God and resolve our issues. We fasted when the church's income was said to be dropping. We fasted when leaders were ill. We fasted when people died. We had our own personal fasts just for the heck of it, or when we felt especially guilty and out of touch with God. Parents were encouraged to get their children involved as young as possible. My parents tell me that I started observing the annual fast when I was three years old. I remember one year when my brother was two or three. At one point during the day, he just broke down sobbing because he was so thirsty. Oh yeah, we abstained from food and drink. We got obscenely dehydrated every time. Looking back, I just don't understand how a parent can behave that way. They were so negative, I can't even describe it. We spent so much time and energy frantically thinking that we can't think about the opposite sex. 
that it was all we thought about. It was evil, dirty, wrong, and it would hurt if we weren't married. I literally built up so much fear over it that when I finally did, as an unmarried adult, that I had developed a pain condition. The cause is often psychological. In my case, being so afraid of it hurting that it hurt, which further fed into my fear. There was actually an entire message once where one of the leaders took on the subject, are we a cult? And he actually went through a checklist for us. His conclusion was that we were a cult, but that it was a good thing. We should be proud. Only not. Pride is a sin. We should be pleased. You had to be baptized before a minister would marry you. You couldn't be baptized and marry someone else who wasn't. You couldn't marry outside the church. Some ministers wouldn't baptize you if they thought your only incentive was to get married. There were rampant cases of abuse from the leadership, but we were always too fearful to report it. Always taught that it must have in some way been our fault. Traditional gender roles were enforced, i.e. women stay home, pop out babies, cook and clean. Men were to work and support the home. Having children, and lots of them, was strongly encouraged. Be fruitful and multiply and all that stuff. Adoption was frowned upon, even for those who were unable to have their own children. So many families were living in poverty because there were just too many children to take care of. God forbade that any of them have a medical condition that required constant treatment. We were robbed on a regular basis. They called it tithing. Not only did we give 10% of our entire income, but we were also to a set second 10% aside to be used at a seven day religious convention of sorts every year. And on every third year, we would give an additional 10% to the church. Imagine losing 20% of your income every year and 30% every third year. Imagine being poor to begin with. Imagine being told that you are poor because you have been literally stealing from God by not diligently paying your tithes. I could go on forever. There is so much. I was into drugs and trouble when I was a teenager, and as a last-ditch effort, my parents shift me off to a fundamentalist Christian treatment center a couple of states away when I was 17. While I did actually end up turning my life around as a result of the whole thing, it sort of ended up being an out-of-the-frying-pan-and-into-the-fire experience, in that once I'd completed the program, which was over a year long, I ended up moving in with a guy who worked there and becoming involved in a church youth group that, unbeknownst to me, of course, was a cult in its initial embryonic stages. It's a long story, but the guy that I moved in with was renting from this guy who was a heavy metal drummer who'd gotten saved and become something of a self-proclaimed prophet within the local charismatic Christian scene and acquired the inevitable cult following that comes along with something like that. I got sucked into his social circle because I was young, insecure and naive and because I'd just gotten done spending 15 months steeped in a culture of biblical literalism and charismatic fervor after a few years of doing as many drugs as I could get my hands on. Take note, drugs tend to have a detrimental effect on the developing mind. One of the girls in the youth group that hung around our place got her school to invite this guy to an assembly program. He brought some musician friends of his played a show, and afterwards talked to the auditorium full of students about his experiences growing up poor and getting sucked in the sex, drugs, and rock and roll thing. Afterward, the school invited him to come back and do the same thing the following year. Long story short, this guy was already kind of a megalomaniac and an ego-driven butthole, and being in a stage in front of all of those kids turned into his new favorite drug. It's hard to explain the process by which I and all of my friends at the time were sort of mentally seduced into devoting our entire lives to helping this guy build an empire of heavy metal high school assembly programs. But within a year, we were all raising money doing car washes, 
grocery baggings, and soon manning tables of merch that just straight up soliciting donations to funnel straight into this guy's pockets. Ostensibly, it was all going to fund these high school programs that we were responsible for booking as many of as possible because the programs were to be free to the schools, but he was actually charging the schools for the Lyceum productions under the table. This is actually really hard to talk about. At the same time, there was a heavy Christian aspect to the whole thing. This guy thought that he had the direct connection to God himself, and there were literally these spontaneous meetings that he would have us all come to at his house, where he would just talk and talk for hours about what God was doing and how we were all called to be part of it. How some would answer the call, while others would choose the world and our own lives instead. I mean, it was some really messed up stuff. And I bought it all, hook, line, and sinker. Even though it never felt right. I allowed myself to be convinced that my reservations were my flesh and the devil, and that the very voice of reason itself was a temptation that God was calling me away from. This went on for a while. The first time I had a falling out with this guy, it was while he was cutting me a check for work that I had done for him. He spontaneously and irrationally attacked me out of the clear blue sky, shoving me up against a wall and swearing a blue streak in my face, all while threatening over and over to break my nose off of my face. I talked him down, walked away, and didn't come back for a year. I was sick in the head though, and I eventually decided that I needed to come back to the Lord. And of course, the way to do that was to track this guy and his team of minions down and give them hundreds of dollars. Suddenly, we were best friends again. The culture of fraud and manipulation had gotten even deeper and weirder while I'd been away. There was now quite a bit of money being raised, not just by soliciting donations at public events, but through high-level investors as well, and everybody was doing the fundraising thing full-time and just stockpiling guns. The leader and his wife would routinely disappear for weeks at a time, and I came to find out that what they were doing was going to Florida and Hawaii a lot because, you know, dangling that carrot is a lot of work. What I'm describing is really a pretty incomplete picture of the whole thing, because I'm really rushing through the story. Shortly after coming back to the group, I realized that I couldn't stand to live like that anymore, and I moved away, back to the state where I grew up, and started my own youth outreach program. But literally, the day I moved away, this guy called me and started working on me to get me to come back into the fold. After seven months, I folded. No pun intended. Sorry, that was terrible. And came back when he offered me some ridiculous amount of money to run the church that he'd started, while him and his ministry team were on the road, where they spent most of their time in those days. Again, to abbreviate things, I will just say that when I moved back, I found myself in circumstances severely different than what he described. And the money, to put it bluntly, never happened. He just swindled me again. Thoroughly disillusioned. I left again. This time for good. And never went back. After about a year, I relapsed under the mental, whatever the heck you call it, that happens to your mind after five years of what I just described. And spent the better part of a decade just working at a coffee shop and getting as drunk and stoned as I could afford to be every night. Something I didn't bring up, though, was that when I first got out of treatment as a teenager and got involved with that youth group, I'd started seeing a girl, and after a year, we'd gotten married. She'd been with me the whole time throughout this experience, and after leaving that group for good and spending years and years drunk off my butt, she finally convinced me to get some help, which I did. I went into treatment again and got cleaned up, and then went to college and earned an AAS, and I actually just got my first job in the field this week. Well, 99% sure, just waiting on a phone call here. So the story does have sort of a happy ending. Well, the best part of it is that within the past couple of years, literally every one of my friends from back in the day that were involved with this guy finally walked out on him and blew the whistle on the whole fraud thing. So, it looks like he's probably up the creek. 
a local news media outlet, has been following the story for the last couple of years now. But I don't think that I'm supposed to post a link to any of that, since it would reveal personal information and stuff. But yeah, the whole thing was just a huge nightmare. It's very difficult for me to talk about this, but maybe it's time. Note, I'm 27 now, and this all happened when I was 18 and 19 years old. I wasn't raised in church. My grandparents grew up with very religious parents and didn't want to force anything on us. That being said, in high school, I got very curious about God, religion, etc., I started dating a guy when I was in the ninth grade who took me to church with him. He was a Southern Baptist, so I kept going. We broke up, but that's important because that was my first experience with church. I just wanted to do the right thing. That isn't what this story is about. It's just a little bit of background. Fast forward to my senior year. I started dating a guy in my grade. He was always popular and pretty mysterious. Everyone knew that he was religious, but didn't know what kind. They knew because his mom would attend our choir concerts, always wearing long skirts, no jewelry or makeup, and had her hair in a bun. His best friend didn't even know what church he went to, but told me that they didn't have a TV and weren't allowed to watch movies. I was very nervous to ask him what church he went to, even though we were dating, and I figured after three months I should know. I asked him a few times to go with me to the Baptist church, but he always declined. Finally, I got up the courage. I asked him what church he went to, and he only replied with, you should see for yourself. I was excited. I got to be a part of it and his life. He invited me to his church. I went out and bought a long skirt and threw my hair up. I figured I should be respectful and dress like his mother. He picked me up that following Wednesday evening and drove me to the meeting. It was at a Holiday Inn conference room. Everyone was very old except for me, my boyfriend, his younger brother, and two toddlers. The meeting, that's what they called it, was run by two very elderly women from Ireland. Pretty sure it was Ireland. I could barely understand them, but the Bibles they used were normal Bibles, so I didn't feel too uncomfortable. They had a hymnal that just said hymns on the front. Everyone sang a cappella. There were never instruments. It was a very strange evening, but because they used a typical Bible, I figured it was fine. I eventually stopped attending the Baptist church that I was part of and went strictly to my boyfriend's meetings. Wednesdays were held at the Holiday Inn, and Sundays were held in various friends' houses. Every member was called a friend. The meetings weren't huge maybe 10 to 20 people. Each fall and spring, though, they held conventions. They would be on someone's farm and would be every friend in the state and sometimes a few surrounding states. Those were very, very big. We would stay in quarters and listen to people speak from the Bible. You also had a chance to stand up and read a verse that meant something to you. This all happened very slowly and over the course of two years or so, I must have been obsessed with just trying to do the right thing and follow Jesus because I didn't notice that I was being brainwashed. I ended up living with him. I have no idea to this day how that transition ever happened or if my parents ever wondered where I was. My parents were in the middle of a messy divorce and honestly probably didn't notice that I was gone. My boyfriend's mom didn't believe in using hospitals or doctors and took a holistic approach to her family's and my health. She had me on different vitamins every day of the week. I was already very skinny, but over time, I lost even more weight. I probably got down to about 80 or 90 pounds. She also gave me iodine drops under my tongue every day. This all led to me being severely underweight and I had stopped sleeping almost completely. I think the doctors said that it was all the vitamin B12 in my system. 
While in a hazy state of mind, I ended up getting baptized in a lake at one of the conventions. Shortly thereafter, when we went home, I started having panic attacks. Everything from this time is such a blur to me. Such a blur. I eventually had one big panic attack that threw me over the edge. I had a complete mental breakdown. I remember a few things very vividly. I tried to read the Bible to calm down, and I couldn't read anymore. Everything was just shapes and blobs. This led to more crying. My dad remarried two weeks after the divorce and married a woman named Nikki. I was convinced that they were both Satan because of this. I tried to jump off of a very high hill near my house that I was staying at. I would have at the very least broken many bones if not died. I thought I was already dead and was convinced that their house was a coffin and they were burying me outside and my soul was just overhearing it all. I guess they realized that something was wrong and probably didn't want to be liable because they found my dad's number and told him to come get me. I fought going and cried and screamed, but my dad took me back to his house. I didn't sleep that night again and thought that his house was the Twin Towers and I was stuck inside as they were falling down. I started seeing small rainbows everywhere. My brain was totally screwed up, you guys. The next day, my dad and stepmom took me to a behavioral health hospital. I remember that it was the day that Steve Irwin died because my dad told me in the waiting room and I thought for sure that he murdered Steve Irwin and that's how he knew that he was dead. But it was on the news in the waiting room. Either way, I stayed in an acute wing of the hospital for two weeks. They took my vitals several times a day and night. I had to go to group therapy sessions and drink in shore all day until I was finally up to a healthy weight. That man and his family really messed me up. I hope that I never see them again. It's almost 10 years later, and I still have nightmares about them. I had one last night, actually. They're mostly just present in the dream. I had the courage to finally try and Google the name of their cult. It took some digging, but they're called two by twos. Sorry that this was so long. So much happened to me. This is just all I can remember. When I was in my early teens, my parents had this midlife crisis. They were always religious but they encountered this group that took it to a whole other level. Certain facets of their faith were somewhat neglected and their marriage wasn't very stable at this time. So they grasped onto this and took us along for the ride. It all started out with a summer camp, something innocent sounding enough. There were about 35 other boys going to it from all over the country. I would later realize this summer camp wasn't really about swimming, playing games and sports going on day trips to places like Niagara Falls or Washington, D.C. It was the first stage of their recruitment to join. Most of the children there were from larger families that were intimately familiar with the group. A lot of their older or younger brothers were attending the camp. Most of them had gone for years because the purpose of the program was to draw in boys to their boarding school. In fact, the camp took place at the boarding school campus. After the summer program was over, my brother wanted to go there for high school instead of local public school. I had really no desire to go to the public school after the absolutely horribly 8th grade year that I had at the middle school next door. So that, coupled with the pressure of my parents and brother, had me going to the boarding school that September. Things started off decently. There wasn't much pressure, but it was a very religious school prayers several times a day. There was the option to go to church every morning, and instruction was completely from their unique Catholic perspective in every way. I would attend this school for three years, two on, one off, and my graduate year. The school really served as the second stage to their organizational recruitment. Not everyone who attended joined or was expected to join, but those who showed enough fervor or interest were groomed to becoming full-time members. 
when I was 16, I knew full well that I wasn't ever going to join the group. But my brother did. I'm not sure if my brother just never had much luck with girls, but he decided to forgo all of that for the cause and joined right after he completed high school. For the most part, I never really realized how far out this organization was until years later when I had a crisis in my own religious faith and became a non-believer and saw how they treated the many people who left the group over time. Most, if not all, who leave the group don't lose their faith, but there was a lot of ostracizing. While in the school, we did a lot of things with the rest of the group, including protesting campaigns for things that we didn't fully understand, attended some of their Saturday meetings at their headquarters, events, conferences, marches, etc. Their methods were not extreme, but they fostered a severe us-versus-the-world mentality. Rock music was satanic. Anyone who didn't embrace our version of belief and morals was a monster and horrible person. Everything was seen in black and white, and they couldn't comprehend how somebody could disagree on one thing with them, yet agree in many other things. At their meetings, they did a lot of patting themselves on the back by talking of their campaigns and the supposed success of them, how they were going to bring the world back to order, which according to them meant their version of Catholicism. Most of them didn't even like the Pope at the time because he wasn't fire and brimstone enough. Speaking of that, a lesser talked about subject publicly, but strongly believed and discussed privately, was that the world was going to enter this period of death, destruction, and end times that would last many years. Even they prepared for it in some ways, by building a sort of bomb shelter in one of the buildings. This would then be followed by a thousand-year reign of Mary, in which they would lead the world back to religion, and it would be happy times and glory to be had for all. My brother even bought into this stuff a lot when he was younger, mocking me for my interest in technology, because it isn't going to do you any good when the nukes fall and there is no electricity. That was probably just a harmless tease on his part, but it always irritated me that he actually thought living like a hermit was the best, most productive use of our lives, or that foregoing technology was wise, because you might have to live without it at some point. As it is, my parents still like the group. I see my brother once, maybe twice a year, and I don't really communicate with anyone there anymore. For years, though, my brother didn't want to visit us. He was always terrible about planning it and acted like it was unimportant. It did bother my parents that he had separated himself from us to such an extent but now that they are more religious than ever, they see it as a good thing that he is doing there. My mom almost got involved with a cult when I was little. She met this elderly couple who was a part of a church and would come over every Thursday and Friday to say prayer, talk about God, and read the Bible with my mom. I thought it was nice, because my mom is a big Christian, so I thought that it was nice that she finally had someone to talk to. But then things started getting odd. They started getting more aggressive, so to say. My mom told me one day that the man in the couple was feeling something was not right in our household. He never said what he meant until a week later. He said my dad and I were not right with God and were too worldly, and that my mom should leave us. She didn't really let this get to her though, mainly because I think she was lonely. They then started asking for money, or a seed. We were super broke at the time, but my mom still gave them somewhere between 5 to $10 a week. But then it got really weird. I finally met them one day because I was stuck at home from school due to being sick. My mom suggested that I meet them, and I did. They started doing that thing where one person will be praying really loudly and telling the devil off while the other one was behind me. Next thing you know, she's poking my forehead. I didn't know what she was doing, so I asked her to please stop. 
She kept going until my mom made her stop. The lady said that I am too worldly and that my time will be soon. Okay. Here's how I know that they were a cult. Remember how I said that they suggested that my mom leave? They tried to make her leave one day, saying that she could live with them and that they have a big house with their church on the property and a few other members stay there too. My mom obviously said no, but they were not having it. They basically tried to mentally force my mom into going. She said it worked a little, but she knew what was right. She called the police, and the police made them get off the property while they screamed, yelling, have fun burning in hell, and other like terms. Two years pass, and I'm watching the news with my mom, when wouldn't you know it, the couple were on the news. They were charged with attempted kidnapping of another family's two to three kids. Yeah, they were definitely in a cult. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Get an excellent night's sleep, everyone, and I'll read to you in the next video. Bye-bye now.